So tonight and next week we'll be exploring what I sometimes think of as key, three key facets of, of spiritual practice that really serve our awakening and our freedom. And there's an, e- an ancient teaching story from the Upanishads that I've always loved and every time I revisit it I feel like there's more that, that comes out of it as happens with all really good teaching stories. So I'd like to um, share with you a bit of this story and we'll use the story as a kind of grounding for both weeks. And I'm going to read you a little bit of what you can find. Uh, it's one of the versions you can find on the web of Nachiketa and the Lord of Death. So Nachiketa is a young man from India. He's the son of a rich merchant who also happens to be a very miserly guy. And when his father was making donations in order to receive a gift from the gods, Nachiketa noticed that he was donating only the cows he owned that were old, or lame, or blind. So publicly, he um, brought this up. He challenged his father and basically, in his father's shame and anger, his father said, I give you to Yama, which is death. And now that's kind of like saying go to hell, you know, but he said, I give you to Yama. And um, Nachiketa, being a very sincere young man and taking things literally, he thought, okay. So he took him for his word and went off into the dense forest searching for death. And finally he sat and waited for death to appear and he sat through pain and he sat through hunger and he sat through exhaustion. And he arrived in the land of Yama He was greeted by Yama's three assistants who were, as you might imagine, pestilence, famine, and war, (laughs) his three assistants. And they told him death was out. So he said, I'll wait. And he waited. And he waited through three days that were pretty intense, pretty miserable for him, but he waited patiently. And finally Yama arrived and sensing the boy's patience and his determination and his sincerity, He offered him any three boons, any boons of his choosing to uh, continue on his spiritual journey. So Nachiketa's first wish was for peace with his father, that all be forgiven, that that he live his life with an undefended heart. And he knew that he couldn't move on in his spiritual path if he was pushing his father or anyone out of his heart. So that was his first uh, request and it was granted and his heart was quite open and free from that. His second request, his second wish, was for inner fire. Now inner fire is really that, sometimes called the sacred fire, it's the energy that brings the path alive. It's a quality of devotion and courage to really commit ourselves fully, to give everything we've got to what we're doing. And when we do that, when we give ourselves fully to the path, of course, there's a profound kind of freedom that's possible. So that was granted. So here he had, his heart was open and his energy was alive and full for really going the whole 10 yards. And he was asked what his third wish might be. And he said, for my third wish, I want to realize the truth of that which is beyond death. I want to know the mystery of that which is timeless, which is immortal. Now, Lord Yama was taken aback. You know, he said, you know, look, this is your third and final wish. You could have anything you want. You could have beautiful women or maidens that could accompany you. You could have the chariots with the fastest steeds in the kingdom to carry you on your way. You could have your own palace. But Nachiketa was not to be swayed. He's not easily derailed. He knew what he wanted. And he actually asked Lord Yama, well, won't any of these gifts that you uh, give me return eventually to your kingdom? And Yama said, well, you got a good point there, (laughs) you know. So he agreed and he gave him the final gift. And what he gave him was a mirror. He gave him a mirror and basically said that he couldn't give him the wisdom, but Nachiketa could learn to look into his own mind, look into his own awareness, and discover the truth and freedom that he yearned for. 
So he was basically given the mirror and advised to ask the most fundamental question that we can ask on the spiritual path. Who am I? Who am I? As the story goes, Nachi Keita gazed into the mirror and he entered deeply into this inquiry. And in time, all delusion fell away and he saw the purity and radiance of his being. So this is the the unfolding of the story. He realized his timeless essence and he was free. And the final event of the story, um, we will will explore a little bit later, perhaps um, next week, but to know that these three blessings, this blessing of forgiveness, of uh, the undefended heart, of the inner fire that lets us devote ourselves and of a pathway to turn our attentions right into the mystery of who we are are the three boons, the three blessings that we'll be exploring uh, this class and the next. And what we'll do is, uh, particularly for tonight, we'll stay with just the first of the three blessings because there's a lot in that one. Nachi Keita's journey began with disillusionment. Okay. There are other stories, other versions that describe how he had recently lost some friends in an accident or some un- misfortune. And of course he had a, a real severing with his own father. And, and so it is with all of us that our, our journey begins with some sort of a um, disenchantment. And it's the given that the the great gateway is realizing impermanence, that early on or not so early on, we get that everything goes, everything changes. These bodies age and get sick and die and everyone that we care for and love, their lives also pass. And so sometimes it happens in big ways in our lives. Sometimes it's very sudden that we get a, you know, get a positive reading on a biopsy or someone that we love has a serious illness or a relationship, 20 years or whatever crashes, betrayal. So sometimes it's, it's those big ways and, and in these recent years for many it's been uh, the profoundness of, of financial insecurity, of not having the meaningful type of work that can orient our lives. So it's some disillusionment, some shaking of the ground. It's not always so outwardly painful. For many of us the the sense of impermanence and of change happens when when we start getting that life just doesn't cooperate, that our own moods are out of our control, they just happen. And these bodies and the people around us, we can't control them really, even though we try like crazy. So we start getting that there's a lot out of control. There's two possibilities when we start confronting the truth of impermanence, that there's really not a self behind the curtain that can keep on rigging things to make it work out the way we want it. There's two possibilities. Now one is that we scramble, we try harder to control things. And you see many people just getting tighter and smaller in how they run their lives. They get more um, anxious and controlling with other people, uh, more tight and narrow in their own lifestyle, more pursuing the kind of addictive behaviors that we try to do to control how our body feels or how our mind is feeling. The assumption there is something's wrong. Not only, it's out of control, that we all know, but the added assumption is this is bad, this is wrong, and then in some way I need to, I need to grab on. And, and so there's a real tight grip, a tightness. There are many little Zen stories about grasping. One of the ones that has always charmed me is of a guy who's chased by a tiger and he falls off this precipice and and he's hanging perilously from a limb. Tiger's, you know, kind of going back and forth above and there's these jagged rocks below. 
And so he calls out, he you know, yells out in desperation, help, help, is anyone there? And um, there's a voice that goes, yes. He goes, help, is that God? God, are you there? Yes. God, will you help me? Yes, I will. You know, so the man just says, what can I do? I'll do anything. God says, just let go. Is anyone else there? You know? <laughs> So we'll do anything but let go. And we have our, our preferred ways of hanging on. I mean, we, we think it might be easy to let go of this and this, but we have certain ones we're just not willing to let go of, and often they're thought patterns. We will not let go of certain thought patterns about how things should be and how certain people are doing things wrong, how we're doing things wrong. That's what we really hold on to, okay? So I said there's two possibilities of what we can do uh, when we realize it's out of control, it's changing. We can either grasp on more tightly or we can do what I sometimes call take refuge in truth, which means become aware of what's actually here in the present moment. Let be, you know, relax the grip and let be the life of the present moment. That's the other option is we become more aware, we inhabit awareness. Now, I want to mention the, the primary way that we resist, that we do grasp on, because it relates to the first boon, is that one of our deepest patterns of conditioning when life is difficult is to assign blame. And I find myself uh, in my own life reflecting on this a lot. You know, I see how blame isn't always really um, a kind of outrage condemnation. It's a much more subtle thing of on some level when things don't feel good, either assuming I'm doing something wrong or in some way being irritated or impatient with others. So it can be subtle or it can be the kind of blame that has to do with a profound lack of forgiveness, hatred, anger. But it's a deep conditioning. When things feel scary, when things feel out of control, to blame. And that's why Nachiketa requested the first boon, which is really a heart that's not armoring itself with blame, a forgiving heart. So we'll be exploring that boon, that, uh, that particular area of freedom for the rest of of the evening. And I want to also mention that I've noticed many people have trouble with the word forgive. So I'll just kind of say that you can think of it like this first gift or blessing is a forgiving heart, or you might think of it as a compassionate heart, a heart that's willing to, rather than blame, open in an undefended way to what's here. So maybe we begin with a, a, a scan in our own lives, just to take a moment to check in. And sensing that whenever we blame ourselves or others, we're creating separation. And just to invite you to take a few moments to see where this might be true in your life. Where on either the more low-key ways or the more uh, blatant ways, where are you creating separation? And it might be separation with others. There may be somebody in your close-in circle that you just have a resentment towards for not holding up their own in some way in the household or a colleague at work. Or it may be a deeper kind of you felt betrayed, misunderstood, injured deeply, but where is your heart continuing to in some way hold somewhat at a distance? Just take a moment and note that, because we'll be coming back to this in a reflection a bit later.
So again, you might be noticing the small kind of aversive judgments that you that you have as a kind of a pattern, maybe it with a partner, how they drive, maybe towards yourself, the way your your eating habits, maybe the way your child relates to chores or it might be someone that you don't know but you really have a judgment towards, a newscaster, a politician. But just to sense that because it's in most of us and it keeps us from an open-heartedness. Are some of you maybe considering the more huge and obvious places of resentment and blame? So as you, you can consider this as we keep on exploring this, but I'd like to at this point make a distinction that I find really important between what I sometimes think of as wise discrimination and aversive judgment. Because you might be wondering, well, aren't there situations where we need to be just honest about, hey, look, this is a problem. And of course there are. And that's the only way, it's part of our survival equipment and our, our, we use our mind well when it's, when it's what we call discriminating wisdom where we can see, look, when, when you do this, this causes harm. You know, when I end up uh, raising my voice and losing my temper with my child, it doesn't help my child to understand what I want them to do or what needs to happen. They just get defensive or scared, you know. So, so wise discrimination just sees the cause and effect, kind of sees the karmic, uh, you know, what, what's causing what, and, and then that understanding helps guide us in our behaviors. That's different from aversive judgment that says, you know, I, I raise my voice, I, get I lose my temper with my child, and I'm just a rotten person. I'm just bad. You know, that, that, that conde condemnation that's not talking about a behavior that we really, really would benefit from changing, but just a real um, aversive condemning of who we are. It's an important distinction. You can feel it in your body as you begin to explore it. So it's important to recognize as we say, okay, I'd like to explore this, this boon, this blessing. What would happen if if I really committed myself to waking up out of aversive judgment. Like, what would happen in my life? How would my life change? It's important to, and this is kind of our being humble, is to recognize that we have this survival equipment, this nervous system and these emotions that are really rigged into us that are designed when things hurt, when we're afraid, this equipment, in a flash, brings up blame and resentment. It's not like we have a time to, th to think about it and it's not a rational decision. I mean, think about when you're cut off on the beltway by a car and, you know, you get that sense that, that could have been a really bad accident. What happens to your body? We get a flash of rage, right? I mean, it doesn't matter how nice a person we think we are. It's like, it's like that's what goes on in our body. We get outraged. And you can see in relationships when we feel misunderstood, are overlooked, are criticized, you know, how quickly our hearts harden and we feel angry. We get mean-spirited in some ways. So how quickly injury and insecurity end up morphing into blame. And then we lash out in some way with our mind or with our actions. It's like the, there's one cartoon of a dog who's on a uh, psychiatrist's couch and he's basically saying, and the psychiatrist is a dog too, he's basically saying, you know, I bark at everything. You just can't go wrong that way, you know, just bark at everything, you know. So, <laughs> and that's the way we are and some, some part of us is geared to do that, just to lash out. And to say that to forgive doesn't mean we're going to be passive. It doesn't mean that um, we're approving of what happens. Um, you know, it's not like we're saying, oh, it's okay that you insult me or abuse me. Uh, we need wise discrimination. 
How many of you read Beatrice Potter or are familiar with Peter Rabbit's stories? Can I see some of you? Okay. Well, this is for you. There was, ran into this, uh, this cartoon with a rabbit at a desk taking an exam. And the question is, write a brief reaction to the following statement. Farmer McGregor is essentially a decent man, you know? <laughs> Now, for those of you who didn't read it, Peter Rabbit's father was basically made into a pie by McGregor's wife. So it's, you know, the bad history there, and it's dangerous to go into the garden and so on. So the point is that we have a strong conditioning in our body not to forgive, not to open our heart. And, and the truth is, it's not about setting ourselves up to be stamped on or made pie of. Um, we also have strong conditioning not to forgive ourselves. And we have a fear, and they can just check in on this one, that if there's something you really don't like about yourself, there's this fear that if we get tender towards our being, if, if we open with compassion in some way, if we say, you know, let me hold this with kindness, what's our fear? will never change, right? Yeah. I could tell you were about to say that. <laughs> yeah, that we'll stay the same. We might get worse. Maybe we're indulging ourselves. It's like some of you might know uh, Deep Thoughts, Jack Handy. He says, the first thing was I told myself, I learned to forgive, and then I said, go ahead and do whatever you want. It's okay by me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's like this indulging that we're afraid of. So forgiving does not mean we're erasing all boundaries. Um, the undefended heart is still intelligent. It knows how to guide us in taking good care of ourselves or those that we're responsible for. I sometimes think of it like this, that we can be practicing in this deep way of releasing aversive judgments, of just letting this wise discrimination guide us. We can release, we can forgive, and we can commit ourselves ever more deeply. We can take a vow to never ever let that hurtful behavior happen again, to do whatever is within our power to protect ourselves or others. Some of the people that I know that are most forgiving are also the most um, dedicated social activists. It's spiritual activism. So the truth is, and the reason that this becomes so important on the spiritual path, is that when you are in a place of blame, when you're holding a real negative judgment towards yourself or another person, you're in trance. You're in a trance. You're not seeing clearly the world. Um, our story blocks out the larger truth of who we are in that moment and who the other person is. We're in a, in a deluded trance. This is how Mark Twain puts it. He says, when I was 14, my father in particular was such a fool. I was embarrassed to have him around. I marveled at 21 how in seven years the old fellow had learned so much. <laughs> So you might reflect for a moment uh, in your own life. And again, this is a, a chance to, if you'd like, close your eyes and just sense how you might be in trance when judgment gets strong. First by considering someone maybe in a close circle of friends or family. And what's it like when you lock into a feeling of real blame or resentment with that person. This is somebody you care about but bugs you and that you get reactive towards. And when you're feeling blame, that sense of you're doing something wrong, you should be different. How does that other person appear to you? In other words, what is it you're noticing about that person? What happens when your attention narrows and you're fixating on wrongdoing? How does that person look to you? 
Do you like the way that person looks? Consider what you might be forgetting in those moments the vulnerability or unmet need that might have driven that person to act the way they're acting. Maybe you're forgetting that this person is really wanting to be happy, wanting to feel loved, wanting to feel good about themselves. You might know all that at other moments, but in this moment of blaming, consider what you're forgetting. This person's basic goodness. Take some moments as you're considering when you're blaming, when you're resentment, resentful, what is your experience of yourself? How does it feel to be in your own mind, your own body? What's your identity? Is it with an oppressed self or a victimized self or an outraged self or a wronged self? What's the self-identity you've taken on when you're in blame mode. Just to notice that trance is when we step into a smaller self than the being that we are. Do you like who you are when you're blaming? Think of the trance that we go into when we have an enemy in a social way. Maybe it's a a group of people, a country, a religion, politician, a political party. You can open your eyes if you'd like. But what's that like? I mean, can you sense how much smaller we get when we start targeting and having an enemy? What if our enemy is a sports team that's threatening our favorite team? I mean, how much is this build up to the Super Bowl effect? In my household, we have, I have a couple of guys who go into very much of a good guy, bad guy kind of mentality around the playoffs. I mean, it's like, maybe they don't believe it deep down, but the energy is that, right? I mean, I bring it up on purpose, because it is this time of year that both with the Super Bowl and also with the elections, how many of us can read the newspaper and not on some level start Um, having a filter of who's good and who's bad, who we're for, who we're against. And and it's very, very, it's very um, physical. There's a kind of violence and aggression and dislike and distaste or a, yeah, that's my team, you know, feeling. So it's interesting to investigate how much of this culture fuels this sense of us and them, bad and good, you know, not okay. And, and you can think of the violent video games that have an enemy you're going after or the themes of most movies and TV shows that are, uh, you know, kind of, the kind of action shows or, as I mentioned, political warfare. It leaves it easier to not challenge when our own psyche is resentful of somebody for something smaller. We go very quickly into, you should be different, you're not okay. So we have a deep investment in how the world should be. We want it to be a certain way so we feel good and our lives work out. And when we aren't the way we want to be, there's a feeling of I should be different and it's very hard to forgive ourselves. When others are not the way we think they should be, you should be different and it's very difficult to accept people are as they are. When the world is not doing it the way we want it to be, we get outraged. The Flying Cross was an award to Percy the Pigeon, okay, who flopped down exhausted in a Sheffield loft, having beaten a thousand rivals in a 500 mile race, he was immediately eaten by a cat. So here's this pigeon, he beat out all the rivals, a thousand rivals, it's a 500 mile race, he's eaten immediately by a cat, The 90-minute delay in finding his remains and handing his ID tag to the judges relegated Percy from first to third place. Now, is that fair? (laughs) You might be wondering, now, why am I reading that to you? (laughs) It's just so weird that I... (laughs) 
but it, it violates our sense of should. I mean, this little pigeon was, did this amazing job, gets eaten by a cat and loses first place for it. Okay. <laughs> I knew that when I put that in my file that I just, I wasn't going to figure out how to fit it in, really. <laughs> anyway. So the upshot is, when we live in shoulds, when our heart is in a should, you should be different, and it closes down. And it doesn't matter how right it seems we are, if our heart is pushing someone else away, or if we're rejecting a part of our own being, our heart is defended and closed and we're not available to really see life as it is, we're in a trance, we're not available to move on this journey of freedom. So that's why Nachiketa chose us as the first layer, this defended heart. And, and the truth is that we don't have a full capacity to love if we are in resentment and blame towards anyone. Not a full capacity. Now, I want to share um, a story, I, I think last year I, I brought it up here. I read a book called Tattoos on the Heart, and it's by Gregory Boyle, and I recommend it highly. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. And uh, Boyle is a priest, a Catholic priest, who works in uh, the worst gang violent uh, violence kind of neighborhoods in LA, and he cre has created businesses and and all sorts of support for some of the gang members to help them make this transition. Well, he tells a story of a woman named Soldad, who's a mother of four, and she's very, very proud when uh, her son, her second oldest son, gets his diploma and he goes to the Marines. He actually, she found it later on, went to Afghanistan. And um, he comes back home for a visit and goes out to pick up some fast food and she hears the shots outside. And when she opens up the front door, she, her, her son Ronnie dies in her arms in the front door. Soon after, her oldest boy, Angel, uh, pulled off something very few in the hood would do. He graduated from high school, and he, he, he just helped Soldad you know, get through those, the hell she was living in for six months. You know. And he finally he pleaded with her at the end of six months, put on some clothes with some color, get your hair done, you know, be a mom to your three ma remaining children. And that afternoon, and she did it, she gussied up and he gave her a lot of support and she finally was pulling out and that afternoon uh, they were sitting and uh, she was sitting and eating a sandwich on the front porch and Angel got called out and he was shot up by a rival gang of kids. So Boyle writes about her and he says that she was uh, he describes her, he says, later that day she was sobbing into a huge bath towel. The few of us there found our arms too short to wrap around this kind of pain. The next couple of years she was locked into the anguish of separation. So um, he, he spent a lot of time with her and described at one meeting how he asked her how she was doing. She said, you know, I love the two kids I have. I hurt for the two that are gone. And then she's crying, she goes, the hurt wins. The hurt wins. Some months after that, she's in the emergency room for some chest pain, and uh, a kid with multiple gunshot wounds is rushed in on a gurney to the spot right next to her, and there's no, no curtain drawn. So she's kind of witnessing him fighting for his life. And she said that she recognized him from the rival gang that killed her boys, and she knew, so she knew who he was. And she knew that her friends might say, pray that he dies for all the violence, all the harm. But that's not what happened. What happened instead is she heard the doctors crying out, we're losing him, we're losing him. And something cracked open and she said she began to cry and she said, I prayed like I had never prayed before, the hardest I've ever prayed, please don't let him die. I don't want his mom to go through what I had to go through. So the boy survived, as did Soldad's capacity for loving. In other words, she got ripped open by grief, but that became this unimaginable openness. And I share this story because, at first, 
When we are injured badly by another, at first the hurt wins. It's part of our evolutionary design to go into reaction to hurt and to cover our hearts and protect ourselves. So not forgiving is a natural phase. And in fact, you can't will forgiveness. It's like, you know, willing your a certain muscle to just um, relax when it's trying to protect you against um, somebody attacking you. You cannot will it. So we are designed to not forgive for a while. It's natural to contract, to hate, to blame. But that's not the end of our evolutionary potential. We also have this capacity to sense human suffering and to care and to come around to that even if we have been defending our heart. We have the capacity to wake up to that. Many of you have probably heard of Steven Pinker, who is a leading evolutionary psychologist, Harvard-based. Uh, well, he, he wrote a, a book called Better Angels of Our Nature, and his thesis is that there's actually a decrease in violence on the globe, and it's been happening steadily. It might not look that way, but there's actually less and less violence and more and more cooperation. That's that our brains are developing and that the, the higher centers of our brain are activated and, and this is what's so interesting, as we awaken spiritually as humans, we then can choose the practices and ways of paying attention that continue to evolve our brain. This is what's so radical about evolution. We're evolving and we're learning how to then facilitate our evolving. And that's where compassion practices come in. That's where the intention to forgive comes in. I say it a lot, but you can't will forgiveness, but you can be willing. You can leave here tonight, you can, with more of your intentionality mobilized to recognize aversive blame and to wake up from it. You can have more intention to have an undefended heart. That can be your intention and that's what opens the door. So there are trainings in this and we do the practices often here. And there are labs around the world now that are doing uh, research and trainings in compassion, looking at the effect of the brain when you do these practices, finding how it definitely activates the left prefrontal cortex and the parts of the middle brain that are associated with empathy, with compassion, with kindness. And in Stanford, which is a, has a, um, a center called C-Care, the Center for Compassion and Altruism, uh, the Dalai Lama saw what they were doing. He donated, it's the first time he's donated personally to any facility he donated to Sea Care because they're doing these eight week trainings and all this research on the impact of compassion. Because if we can train ourselves, train these parts of our brain to, to uh, more quickly let go of blame and open in an undefended way, that's the hope for peace on earth this evolutionary capacity to facilitate our evolution. This is where the hope is. So in these immediate lives, in our own lives, it's the precursor to freedom, to be able to let go of our armoring, wherever it is around our hearts. And uh, this is the wisdom that Soldad knew deep down. The hurt was winning, but didn't have to be that way. This is the same wisdom that so many spiritual leaders know. Nelson Mandela, when he, peace and reconciliation process in South Africa. We see it with Martin Luther King who refused to let and respond with hatred to hatred to continue that cycle of violence. Refused it. We see it with the Dalai Lama who talks about the Chinese as my friend, the enemy. His religion is kindness. We see it in awakening beings and it's really the, uh, the pathway that each of us can choose. So it comes from understanding. 
It comes from understanding that we have deeper freedom if we're not living in blame. Maybe it, since I have enough time, I'll, I'll share with you a, a story of uh, one client I worked with some years ago. Um, his wife had left him, and his first reaction from that hurt, again, his, his spacesuit survival reaction was, you know, a sense of rage and a sense of blame that, that she broke her promise, she betrayed his trust. And he began to triangulate with the kids, you know, and, and in some way to try to pull them to his side. And the amount of confusion and anger and dysfunction that that produced woke him up. He realized he couldn't, he couldn't do it. He could not keep on playing the story of, to his wife of, you're bad, you're wrong, you should be different. But what he did was he flipped it. And this is what we often do. As soon as we withdraw our blame of another, where does it go? Moi. So then, then, the blame, then he was blaming himself. I'm unworthy. I didn't meet her needs. I failed in this relationship. And that was suffering. So I asked a question that I often ask, which is, if you had to put down your story of blame, if you had to just stop believing the story of I'm bad, I'm unworthy, I blew it, what then would you have to feel? And when he put aside that story, he actually plunged very deeply into a place of powerlessness and fear. And the fear was, I'll never be close to anyone again. I'll never have connection. And, and then we explored, as we do with RAIN, the acronym RAIN, and, and these practices of mindfulness, well, what is that place in you need that's afraid? And what it needed was compassion. So he did, he did many, many weeks of, in some deep way, just offering a very kind presence to the place of him, in him that was afraid he'd be alone for the rest of his life. Loneliness is deep in us. It's a big fear. So that was this compassion and presence. And that was the beginning of his healing. As soon as he stopped blaming her and stopped blaming himself, he was actually able to start healing a place, a deeply rooted place of fear. And this is the real message in forgiveness. There's no healing possible until we put down the story of blame. We can't make any traction. We can't see the unmet needs that are there. We can't respond to them within ourselves. For him, once he was able to be, regard himself with compassion, he was able to look at her through different eyes. And he was able to really see the place in her that felt unloved and didn't feel like he was showing her the kind of love that let her feel more secure. They were able to co-parent. They were able to get outside the blame, blame that kept them at odds. So the teaching is forgiving ourselves, forgiving others opens the way to healing and to freedom. But as we know, and this is going to be the last piece, the most difficult place to forgive is ourselves. When we have a deep belief that I should be different, it's not just cognitive. There is a squeeze and an emptiness and a hole and an ache that feels very physical. It's a physical something's wrong feeling. And it's very hard to work with and, and it's a very deep place. So, again, the first step is having the intention to be kind towards ourselves. It's amazing how much, if you sense from the wisdom within you that that is the path, even though there's a lot of resistance, your intention to be kind can begin to loosen, can begin to soften your, your air, the area of your heart. I mean, I've seen with myself time and time again that when I'm in what seems like a bad mood, when I'm, when I'm feeling unhappy or anxious or down in some way, and if I ask that place in me, well, what are you believing? What's your view of the world? I try to go inside the place of those, that yucky feeling and, and look out. Inevitably, I find that from the view of that place, I'm falling short. 
that in some way I should be different. And it's just in seeing that that the armoring begins to soften. As soon as I see, oh, once again, I've turned on myself, something in me goes, oh, okay, let's try, you know. The beginning of all real shifts towards healing is when we have that intention to be more gentle. So tonight we've been talking about forgiveness and there's the big situations, but I think it's just as important as you scan and, and kind of deepen your attention to look for the small ways, the, the less obvious ways, the kind of incessant small judgments towards ourselves, towards others. It's kind of a, um, often a jadedness or a mistrust or a cynicism towards the ego self but it creates a hardness, a kind of crustiness at the heart. So Charlotte Joko Beck writes, this is Zen teacher, our failure to know joy is directly related to our inability to forgive. Our failure to know joy is directly related to our inability to forgive. as we deepen our commitment to our journey, it's natural to to commit to this forgiving because everything that we long for begins to blossom when when the heart's less defended. Then we can open to who's here. So we'll begin, we'll end the evening with a reflection, as we often do, give you a chance to just explore what this means right here and now in your own body and heart. And as a way of contexting this, I think it's really helpful to think of it as this is a practice of remembering to choose love, to decide on love, to decide on on forgiveness. It means that you're intending. And take away the expectation that all of a sudden your heart will break open and free and the person that you've forever had a grudge towards you'll be embracing because that's not fair to yourself, you know? Just let it be an intention and see what happens when your intention is to open the heart, to be undefended. So closing your eyes, if that's helpful, take a few moments to let yourself arrive right here, be present. sometimes call this a forgiveness sweep, something you can do daily in a very brief way or you can do it and take more time. But it's a sweep because it really helps to aerate and open up and loosen the layering around the heart. And we sweep by beginning to sense if there's anything right this moment, any unpleasantness in the body, any difficult emotion right this moment that once you notice is there, something in you wishes it wasn't there, thinks it shouldn't be there. So is there anything that's wanting acceptance or attention right here in this moment in your body, in your heart? If you notice anything, something you're wanting different, that should be different, how you're feeling, emotion or sensation, then just have the intention to forgive it for being as it is. Forgiving means to let go of the judgment or the armoring. The intention to let be, just to meet with kindness and see what happens. So you're sensing what it means to have an undefended heart when there's something in the body, when there's something in your moods that's not matching how you want it.
and continuing the sweep to be more comp- a comprehensive kind of mindfulness of, of today. Any, any attitude towards yourself about the day? How did the day go? Anything you might be carrying that has some judgment, some blame on how you conducted yourself today. So you might just scan the day. Is there anything that you're carrying, some idea of how you should have been different? Often it's so habitual that we think we should be doing things differently, we don't even notice we're carrying it, and yet that is a layer of armoring that separates us from ourselves. So if you notice something, some judgment about today, again, have that intention to soften in the heart. You might just mentally say the words, forgiven, forgiven, just to touch that blame with kindness. Forgiven, forgiven. And see what happens when you have the intention to let go. So we widen the scan now to sense if there's somewhere that you're carrying more of a deep or ongoing uh, anger or sense of self-condemnation. And this, these are some of the larger, more life currents of how we are turned on ourselves. And just, to, just to include that right now. It might be for ways you feel you've hurt others or that you continue to hurt others or yourself. And if you find something, just to, just to slow down and deepen your attention and see if you can sense the unmet need that drives the very thing you judge. The fear or hurt, the restlessness, the confusion, the unmet longing. that might make you act or behave in ways that you don't like. Just include a larger truth here. And as you do, see what happens if you intend to meet this with compassion versus blame. Again, you might use the words forgiven, forgiven. Just the intention to let go and see what happens. And finally, we widen the scan now to where you might have a sense of dividedness or separation with another person, where you've pushed someone else out of your heart. And just as Nachiketa asked with his father, may we have peace, just allow the intention to arise in your own heart for this capacity to forgive, this capacity to include others in your heart in a wise way. With that intention, you might be able to see the other's vulnerability more. With that intention, you can explore forgiven, forgiven, and just see what's possible.
knowing this has its own timing, not being willful, but just a willingness. A willingness to explore cultivating an undefended heart. I share with you the words of Rumi. He says, very little grows on jagged rock. Be ground, be crumbled, so wildflowers will come up where you are. You've been stony for too many years. Try something different. Surrender. We close with a simple reflection of sensing this heart, this capacity for an undefended heart, a surrendering presence that leaves this heart free to love without holding back. I just invite you to sense how your life might unfold and blossom. The wildflowers that will come up where you are as this heart becomes increasingly less defended and increasingly free. And as a way to bring your intention very much more immediate, you might sense in the next day or two one place where you'd like to experiment, where you'd like your intentionality to be very conscious in putting down blame and opening yourself in this undefended presence, perhaps with one person or with yourself. Very little grows on jagged rock. Be ground, be crumbled, so wildflowers will come up where you are. You've been stony for too many years. Try something different. Surrender. Namaste and blessings. Thank you.